All right, good afternoon, everyone. You're tuning in for the Arthur Kill Terminal scoping meeting. I'm just confirming with our back of house team that our live stream to YouTube is working and the audio and visual displays are working. We'll get started with the meeting in just a few minutes at 2 p.m. Okay, uh, good afternoon once again and welcome. You're tuning in to the remote public scoping meeting for the Arthur Kill Terminal proposal. Uh, for the record, I'll note that the seeker number, City Environmental Quality Review, number is 23DCP056R. My name is Stephanie Shalou, and I'm the director of the New York City Department of City Planning's Environmental Assessment and Review Division, or EARD. Everin Olker Kajar, Deputy Director of the Division, will co host today's meeting. In the event of any technical difficulties on my end, Everin will take over the meeting on my behalf. Uh, we truly appreciate your patience as we're uh, still adjusting to new remote meeting formats. I wanted to to thank everyone who's taken time out of your day to attend this virtual meeting. Um, and I'll also acknowledge that technology like Zoom isn't perfect, but it's an invaluable tool that allows the critical land use and environmental review processes to proceed. I'll also emphasize that we'll hear from everyone who wishes to speak at today's meeting, and the meeting will remain open until we've heard from all speakers. We also welcome written comments and testimony, which will be accepted through 5 p.m. on Tuesday, December 27th, 2022, and we provide written comments with the same attention and consideration as comments provided live today at this meeting. If we can go into the slides. Uh, we will now proceed to the public scoping meeting for the Arthur Kill Terminal proposal. Uh, again, for the record, I'll note that the City Environmental Quality Review or Seeker application number for the project is 23DCP056R. Today's date is December 15th, 2022, and the time <laughs> is approximately 2.01 p.m. Next slide. And next slide. Again, my name is Stephanie Shalou, and I'm the Director of the Environmental Assessment and Review Division at the New York City Department of City Planning. I will be chairing today's scoping meeting, as I mentioned. Uh, the Department of City Planning is acting on behalf of the City Planning Commission as the lead agency for this proposal's environmental review. 
As the lead agency, the department will be responsible for overseeing the preparation and completion of the proposal's environmental impact statement or EIS. Next slide. Joining me today are several of my colleagues from the Department of City Planning. Uh, Evren Olker kajar as I mentioned, is the Deputy Director of the Environmental Assessment and Review Division. Jameson Mitchell is the Environmental Assessment and Review Division Project Manager. And from the Department's Staten Island Borough Office, we're joined by Daniel Vieira, Team Leader, and Benjamin Polevsky, the Project Manager for the Land Use Application. Uh, I'll also mention that we're joined by many members uh, from our team at, at DCP who are working in the background to assist us with this remote meeting format. Thanks to everyone who's who's on the line today. Next slide. Together, we're here to re receive your comments on the draft scope of work for the Arthur Kill Terminal proposal. The draft scope of work identifies the subjects that will be analyzed in the upcoming draft environmental impact statement or DEIS and describes the methodologies that will be used in those analyses. The draft scope of work materials are available on the Department of City Planning's website and are also available through the Zoning Applicant Portal or the ZAP Portal. Next slide, please. The purpose of the public scoping meeting is to allow public participation in the preparation of the DEIS at the earliest possible stage of the environmental review process. Specifically, scoping allows the public to, to help shape the DEIS before it is written. Toward that end, the department as lead agency will receive verbal testimony on the draft scope of work from elected officials, government agencies, the local community board, and the public today. As I mentioned, we also welcome written comments on the draft scope of work, which can be submitted through 5 p.m. on Tuesday, December 27th, 2022. Next slide. At the end of the written comment period, the department as lead agency will review all comments, those we hear today, as well as those received during the written comment period. And we will carefully review all comments to decide what changes, if any, need to be made to the draft scope of work. And then we will issue a final scope of work. It is the final scope of work that serves as the basis for preparing the draft environmental impact statement. Next slide. As mentioned, today marks the beginning of the written comment period for the draft scope of work. No, com no decisions will be made today regarding the draft scope, but again, the purpose of today's meeting is to allow the public to provide their comments about the scope of work, allow the department to listen and consider those comments, uh, and again, we will hear all voices that wish to speak today. Next slide. I'll now briefly describe the structure of today's meeting, which will be divided into three parts. First, the applicant team will make a brief presentation describing the Arthur Kill Terminal proposal. The applicant will provide a summary of the environmental uh, draft scope of work, as well as the project. This will take about 20 minutes. During the second part of the meeting, the department will hear testimony from elected officials, government agencies, and members representing the local community board. And during the third and final part of the meeting, we'll receive testimony from members of the general public. Next slide. Uh, a few logistics, if you wish to speak uh, and plan to access the meeting online, uh, please remember to register online uh, through the NYC Engage portal um, or via DCP's website. Uh, a link to join us and provide your testimony will be emailed to you after you've completed the registration process on the NYC Engage portal, and we will add you to our speakers list. Next slide. When it is your turn to speak, your name will be called and you will be promoted to panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and the ability to turn on your camera. There will be a brief uh, period where it appears that you're no longer in the Zoom meeting. Uh, don't be alarmed. You'll automatically rejoin the meeting as a panelist. Um, speakers are limited to three minutes. At the end of three minutes, uh, you'll be asked to uh, conclude your remarks um, and a countdown clock will run on the screen if you're joining us online. Um, at the three minute mark, your time will expire and you will be asked to conclude your remarks. Uh, please note that the promoting to panelist and speaker management uh, takes, takes some time, so please be patient. Um, and a note that if you do uh, wish to turn on your camera, we will be able to see you. Next slide. 
A uh, note for those of you joining by phone, if, if that's anyone, um, I will indicate that I will be accepting testimony from mem members via telephone, um, and then I will ask you to select star nine. Uh, listen for me to call out the last three digits of your phone number, at which point you'll be unmuted and unable to share your testimony. You'll need to press star six to unmute, and we'll be able to hear you speak at the meeting. When your testimony is complete or three minutes are up, whichever comes first, you must press star six again to mute. Uh, we encourage everyone to, to register via the online uh, NYC Engage portal um, or the dial-in participant hotline that's available online. All right, next slide. On to time limits, uh, speakers from the general public are allowed three minutes to give their testimony. There are a few exceptions to the three minute rule. Elected officials are uh, given the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. To those of you viewing us on live stream and wishing to testify, please be mindful of potential background noise during your testimony. Make sure that the live stream is muted when you begin speaking in Zoom to avoid hearing an echo. Next slide. And written testimony. If you wish to submit written testimony, it can be submitted to the Department of City Planning. Our mailing address is 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Attention, Stephanie Shalou. The email address to submit comments for this project is 23DCP056R underscore DL at planning.nyc.gov. This information can all be found on the NYC Engage portal and the DCP website. Again, as a reminder, we'll accept written comments through 5 p.m. Tuesday, December 27th, 2022. Next slide. Uh, if you missed any of the instructions during the beginning of this meeting, uh, please visit www.nyc.gov slash NYC Engage for instructions on how to participate and provide testimony. We'll now move on to the first part of the meeting where the applicant will present an overview of the proposed project, which will be followed by a summary of the draft draft scope of work. I'll now turn it over to the applicant team, starting with Boone Davis. Um, Boone, we're not hearing you. Is anyone? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, th thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Boone Davis. I'm the CEO of Arthur Kill Terminal LLC developer of the Arthur Kill Terminal Project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as offshore wind is a new topic for many, uh, I'd like to start off by introducing the project and providing some basic information on its role and function and why it is so important in the context of our state and our country's goals to build out this major clean energy resource. Uh, there's many dimensions of the project that I won't have time to go over today. So please refer to the information on the project's ZAP page including the draft scope of work for more information. Next slide, please. Arthur Kill Terminal, or AKT, the proposed project uh, is, is shown here. Uh, it involves the development of a purpose-built 32-acre marine terminal between the Charleston and Tottenville neighborhoods of Staten Island. Uh, the port is designed for the staging and assembly of offshore wind components to be erected in the New York Bight and along the East Coast. As a marine terminal, the project is a water dependent use, and the site is located adjacent to a federal navigation channel that's approximately 35 feet wide, uh, sorry, 35 feet deep and 600 feet wide, all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean, providing safe access for all types of vessels needed to support offshore wind construction and operations. Uh, importantly, the project site is also seaward of all overhead air draft restrictions. Uh, and is the only location in the New York Bight that can be developed into an unrestricted marine terminal that meets all of the offshore wind industry's requirements for current and next generation component staging and assembly. Uh, by not subjecting offshore wind construction operations to air draft restrictions, 
Uh, Arthur Kill Terminal will enable the full import assembly of tall wind turbine towers uh, and the use of industry standard jack up wind turbine installation vessels like the one you see here uh, that have 100 meter tall legs uh, that prohibit passage under the Verrazano Bridge. Um, the port will also enable import assembly of complete floating offshore wind turbines and other emerging offshore wind technologies that can't be or aren't easily assembled at sea. Um, by enabling this full range of assembly and installation technologies, methods, vessels, and equipment, and reducing offshore construction time and travel distance, uh, the project will substantially improve offshore wind farm construction efficiency, safety, and cost. Uh, the project represents a total in investment of just under $400 million. Uh, so it will have a very substantial local economic impact and result in hundreds of good paying construction jobs and operations jobs. The project will also position Staten Island in greater New York City to serve as a hub for the emerging $200 billion U.S. offshore wind industry unlocking even more economic opportunity for the city and borough. Next slide, please. The offshore wind industry uses ports for a few different functions, um, manufacturing, staging and assembly, and operations and maintenance. Arthur Kill Terminal will be a wind farm construction staging and assembly port. So it's used for receiving, stockpiling, assembling, commissioning, and testing these wind turbine components before they're loaded onto the vessels and transported offshore for installation. Uh, the wind components themselves will be manufactured elsewhere uh, and the operations and maintenance of the wind farm projects will likely be performed out of other smaller ports, although AKT can be used for major maintenance activities if needed. Um, by enabling not just staging, but also the assembly of the towers and the other tall components, a significant offshore construction activity durations and risks and costs can be minimized, as I said, uh, and by being optimally located close to the majority of the offshore wind farm sites uh, that will be serving the region, um, the project can reduce vessel transit times, costs, and uh, emissions associated with uh, vessel operations building uh, offshore wind projects in the region. Next slide, please. Um, now I'd like to provide some context on why the project is so critical uh, in the context of our offshore wind development efforts and highlight the lack of sufficient port infrastructure to meet our objectives. Um, in February of this year, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management conducted an auction for the leasing of six major offshore wind development areas in the New York Bight. Uh, that fetched a record uh, almost $4.4 billion uh, for the U.S. government and created sites for about seven to 10 gigawatts of additional offshore wind capacity, um, all of which will really be necessary to meet the offshore wind goals of New York and New Jersey. Um, for background, uh, in 2019, New York passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or CLCPA, uh, which requires that the state interconnect at least nine gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2035. Uh, and also stipulates that New York achieve a net zero grid by 2040 uh, and a net zero economy by 2050. Uh, and so in order to, to meet those sort of later targets um, for emissions reductions, uh, New York State's Climate Action Council uh, estimates that New York will need 20 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. Um, the federal government also has objectives for building offshore wind in the U.S. Um, the Biden administration announced a goal for 30 gigawatts by 2030 uh, and more than 100 gigawatts by 2050. Uh, and in order to build out all of this offshore wind capacity, there really needs to be supply chain infrastructure, uh, ports and vessels to, to do the work. Um, presently, there are several other offshore wind staging and assembly ports in various stages of development on the East Coast. Um, just naming a few, a State Pier in New London, Connecticut, uh, Portsmouth Marine Terminal in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, the New Jersey Windport in Lower Alloways Creek, New Jersey, uh, and the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal here in New York City. Um, even with these other ports fully developed, um, New York won't be able to achieve its uh, 9 gigawatt by 2035 mandate because its only other staging port, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, is leased to one offshore wind developer uh, for at least 10 years in connection with 3.3 uh, gigawatts of uh, offshore wind capacity that that developer is under contract to build. 
and New York needs to build another 4.7 gigawatts during this same period. Uh, those ports I mentioned uh, in other states will be uh, occupied supporting projects uh, off of other states and will not be really available to support uh, New York projects during that time frame. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Arthur Kill Terminal is needed to meet this demand for additional staging port capacity in New York. And as I've sort of said before, it's also critically important to maximizing flexibility and minimizing risk associated with offshore wind farm construction. Um, the use of feeder vessels uh, to circumvent air draft restrictions and uh, meet requirements of the Jones Act um, has not been proven yet at scale. And with floating offshore wind likely to be required to meet New York's overall need uh, for 20 gigawatts by 2050, New York will need a port that can support all types of technologies and installation methodologies. Uh, and by not having an unrestricted staging port, uh, there could be serious negative consequences for the timely installation of offshore wind projects in New York and the establishment of a, a diverse local supply chain uh, in New York for offshore wind. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide illustrates the basic design requirements for an offshore wind staging and assembly port. Um, you, you need a large uh, regular shaped facility of at least about 30 acres where you can store uh, football field long blades and other very large heavy equipment. Uh, and you need to have a wharf that can handle the weights of these components, which often exceed a thousand tons, uh, plus the cranes uh, that are used to handle them. Uh, and you need to have a, a ship basin that can berth both inbound and outbound supply and installation vessels without obstacles between the port and the open ocean. Uh, and you also need to have uh, small accessory buildings for offices and equipment and park storage and parking areas for workers. Next slide, please. Uh, the project has undergone extensive analyses of potential alternative locations and designs. Um, we've performed also extensive on-site studies and surveys, all with the goal of ensuring that the environmental impacts are avoided and minimized to the ma maximum extent possible. Uh, over the past six years, more than 70 alternative locations have been evaluated, beginning with um, the New York Offshore Wind Master Plan published in 2017 and several supplemental studies and qualification processes conducted by both New York and New Jersey. Um, we've also expanded upon the work of New York and New Jersey and evaluated uh, more than 10 other sites in the region. Uh, and all of these analyses confirm that this is the only location for this kind of facility. Next slide, please. Uh, this table presents some of the key regional alternatives um, and their qualities in, uh, in relation to AKT, as well as a map of uh, many of those locations uh, in New York Harbor. Uh, I won't go through this in detail, but I would encourage you to review the draft scope of work materials um, and for more information about the project's alternatives analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, in summary, this really is the only site uh, in the region that can provide all of the technical attributes needed for offshore wind staging and assembly. Um, Arthur Kill Terminal is going to be a, a critical asset for meeting New York's offshore wind mandate, uh, for doing so safely and efficiently, uh, for meeting the city and state's broader objectives, for, for also creating uh, local clean energy related jobs and economic development and workforce development. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, this slide provides some more information on the site as it exists today. Uh, the project site uh, is approximately 32 and a half acres. Uh, it's outlined by the orange and red dotted line. Uh, to the north of the site is Outer Bridge Crossing. Uh, to the west is Arthur Kill Channel. To the south is Mill Creek. And to the east is Arthur Kill Road. Um, the orange and blue dotted line shows the 18 acre uh, dredge basin uh, that would need to be created between the bulkhead and the channel uh, to provide access for inbound and outbound vessels. The site is primarily vacant with wooded areas, wetlands, and a single family home known as the coal house. Uh, and the site is zoned M11 and M31 uh, with the black line presenting the boundary between the zoning districts. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the majority of the site is, uh, is upland area, but there are approximately 3.3 acres of freshwater wetlands upland and approximately nine acres of submerged land between the shoreline and the bulkhead line. Uh, I'd refer you to the draft scope of work uh, provided in the portal for more information about the, the impacts to the project. Um, but, but just to pause and address them at a high level, um, although the, the quantities of filling and dredging required to convert this site into a functional offshore wind port are, are significant, uh, this is an essential uh, offshore wind supply chain infrastructure project. And again, the alternatives analysis confirms that this is really the only location uh, where such a facility can be developed for the specific activities envisioned. Uh, there's been substantial disturbance of the site over the years, um, even filling out to part of the bulkhead line prior to 1960, as we're proposing. And, and the results of the natural resource studies and site investigations that we've conducted over the past few years uh, all support the idea that the, the site doesn't provide uh, high quality habitat or have high quality um, you know, vegetated wetland areas. Um, so the benefits of the project, you know, really building offshore wind quickly and efficiently uh, and in a manner that will, you know, create jobs and economic benefits uh, in this clean energy industry uh, for decades to come really need to be considered uh, in light of the, uh, the impacts proposed here. Um, and all of the impacts or, or um, of the cutting and filling would be mitigated offsite pursuant to a compensatory mitigation program that we're currently working with city, state, and federal agencies to develop and implement. Um, the, the only existing structure, just shifting to some of the, the design of the site, um, is the coal house. And it's a, shown in that image on the bottom right here. It's a two-story unoccupied single family residential building uh, built in the mid 19th century uh, that was denied landmark protection status uh, and has fallen into disrepair. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so what we're proposing uh, with this site, again, is to develop a purpose-built marine terminal um, with a 1,365-foot-long key uh, and approximately 28 and a half acres of operations areas for wind farm staging activities. Um, examples of those activities are, are shown in the upper right-hand corner, which we're taking from uh, the construction of the Block Island Wind Farm, uh, which was staged out of the Port of Providence. Um, I just want to confirm that wind turbines would not be uh, assembled and operational like you would see at a wind farm uh, at the project site. You know, that would occur offshore. Uh, it's really a, again, a staging area where these parts would be brought in, um, assembled, commissioned, tested, and then sent offshore. Uh, for that, that part of the, uh, the installation process. Um, the project would also involve the development of a, a tenant uh, area, uh, including the tenant warehouse and office that's shown in the renderings on the bottom left there. Um, this building would be approximately uh, 2,200 square feet and have approximately 109 parking spaces. Uh, and we would also be developing the coal house or, or renovating the coal house into uh, a visitor center uh, and an owner office on the second floor uh, where it currently exists in the southeast corner of the project site. Uh, and that would have 12 parking spaces. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows you um, in plan view sort of the functional areas of the site uh, in the northeast corner in that blue area. That's where that tenant warehouse would be. And uh, item 10 in the southeast corner, that's where the coal house is. Um, to, to address the other points uh, in numerical order, uh, one on the left is the Arthur Kill Channel. Uh, two, the area encircled in purple there is the, the ship basin between the bulkhead and the channel. Uh, that's the pier head line shown in light green. Um, uh, 14 is a jackup vessel pad, which would be placed on the seabed to enable those jackup vessels um, to stand on their legs in the port to perform loading operations. Um, three and five are the inbound and outbound uh, berth, uh, respectively, uh, which would be used for uh, crane operations to load and unload vessels. Um, four and six are inbound and outbound assembly areas uh, where wind turbine parts might be put together. Uh, 
Uh, seven is a general sort of lay down area where you'd see blades and other uh, wind farm components, uh, you know, kind of placed in rows uh, prior to uh, load out. Um, I mentioned eight, nine would be where the main entrance is. Uh, 12 is Arthur Kill Road. Um, I mentioned 10. Uh, and 11 would be sort of a, a secondary egress point really for emergencies um, or as needed uh, in the southeast corner of the site. Next slide, please. Um, I, yeah, I, I wanna kind of emphasize uh, that safety has been top of mind really in all of the, the planning efforts that have gone into the, the project's design. Um, we've been in, engaged extensively with the Port Authority on, you know, outer bridge crossing interfaces uh, and with the maritime community to ensure that uh, vessel and other you know, heavy lifting operations would be conducted in a manner that minimizes risks to the public. Um, this uh, layout that you see here on, on this slide is just reflective of one possible way that the, the port could be used. Uh, each one of the, the tenants of ours, uh, meaning you know, wind farm developers or their installation contractors, uh, we'll have uh, undoubtedly different vessels and different cranes and different wind turbine components. And therefore, they, they might use uh, the site slightly differently. But we've designed it really to, to maximize flexibility uh, and, and safety. Um, so I don't know if, if folks are able to, to really identify what's on the, the, site, uh, the site plan here. But on the, on the left-hand side, that's, that's north. Um, so it just needs to be oriented 90 degrees. Um, and, and in the project uh, operational area, there's a bunch of small boxes. Those are you know, wind turbine generator nacelles. Uh, you can probably identify the very long blades that are being moved around uh, and some of the vessels and equipment that might, might be used to handle them as well as you know, perimeter access uh, roads. And in the upper left-hand corner, the, the tenant area with, with parking spaces uh, needed for the workers. Next slide, please. Um, so that was a, a pretty quick summary uh, um, of the project. And I just wanna you know, close by emphasizing just how much thought and care uh, and community input and feedback has gone into the project's design and programming over the past four years. Um, that being said, we're, we're very eager to hear from anybody and everybody um, who we might not have connected with yet or who might have questions about the project, uh, questions about offshore wind or specific concerns or inputs uh, that you'd like to see addressed. Um, we're fully committed to ensuring that this project is uh, a real asset and not a burden for the community or the environment. Um, so, you know, know that our door is always open and we're always eager to, to hear from folks about uh, their thoughts. Um, we'd also like to encourage uh, people to check out our website at uh, www.arthurkillterminal.com. Um, there we have answers to a lot of frequently asked questions, uh, links to more information about offshore wind, uh, and some contact information if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, now I'd like to hand this over to Joshua Reinsmith uh, to present the proposed land use actions. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Joshua Reinsmith from Anchorman LLP, and I will be pri providing a summary of the uh, requested land use actions that are necessary to facilitate um, the proposed Arthur Kill Terminal Project. Um, these requested land use actions will include an amendment to the city map to allow for the elimination, discontinuance, and closing of Richmond Valley Road um, to the west of Arthur Kill Road, uh, zoning text amendments to several sections of the special South Richmond Development District text, including section 107 to establish goals related to sustainability, uh, resiliency, climate, and clean energy objectives, section 10764 to modify the tree removal regulations, um, and section 10765 to modify the topography uh, modification regulations. Uh, an additional action would include an authorization pursuant to zoning resolution section 10764 as modified 
to allow for the removal of trees of six inch caliper or more um, to create the uh, level uh, working surface that is required for the terminal. Um, we will also be requesting an authorization pursuant to zoning resolution section 10765 um, as modified uh, to allow for topographic modifications um, that are greater than than two feet. Um, and again, that is to create the um, the flat surface that is necessary for uh, the operation of the port facility. Um, we'll also be requesting an authorization pursuant to zoning resolution section 10768 um, to allow more than 30 uh, accessory off street parking uh, spaces within a group parking facility. Um, we will be requesting a special permit pursuant to zoning resolution 10773 uh, to allow light poles uh, at the site that would have a height of greater than 50 feet. Um, and finally, uh, we will be requesting a landfill action to add approximately 8.77 acres of fill to create a key along the Arthur Kill. Um, at this point, I will now turn it over to Abir Sabet, who will be discussing the draft scope of work and framework for the uh, draft environmental impact statement. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Good afternoon. My name is Abir Sabat from Philip Habibin Associates. I will provide an overview of the draft scope of work, which provides the framework for how the DEIS will be prepared. Next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you. The EIS will be consistent with the guidelines of the City Environmental Quality Review Technical Manual, also referred to as the Seeker Technical Manual, which is the standard guidance document for environmental analysis and review in the city. Seeker is a disclosure, doc is a disclosure process by which decision makers evaluate the potential environmental consequences before approving a discretionary action. Seeker compares the future no action condition to the future with action condition through a reasonable worst case development scenario. The EIS will analyze the incremental changes that could reasonably be expected to occur if the proposed actions are adopted. As described earlier, the applicant is proposing an approximately 32 and a half acre state of the art port for the staging assembly and pre-commissioning of wind turbine generators and other offshore wind components. This is referred to as the proposed project. The wind turbine generators would be assembled at the project site prior to being transported and installed at future offshore wind farms that are to be built off the east coast of the United States. The proposed staging and assembly port would not house operating wind turbines. Next slide, please. The analysis year for the proposed actions is 2025, which is the year the proposed port is expected to be completed and operational. A reasonable worst case development scenario was established for the 2025 analysis year with and without approval of the proposed actions. In absence of project approval, referred to as the no action condition, it is assumed that the project site would remain the same as under existing conditions. In the future, with approval of the requested actions, referred to as the with action condition, it is assumed that the applicant's proposed project would be completed. As the proposed project would be limited in height, density, and bulk by the special district authorizations and special permit granted by the CPC, the applicant's proposed project would be considered the reasonable worst case development scenario for environmental analysis purposes. The EIS will analyze the incremental changes between the no action and with action conditions. Next slide, please. As shown in this table, compared to the no action condition, the proposed actions are expected to result in a net increase of approximately 1 million square feet of offshore wind storage and assembly area, approximately 22,472 GSF of warehouse and accessory office area, approximately 4,212 GSF of visitor center and owner office space, and approximately 121 accessory parking spaces. The proposed actions are also expected to result in a net decrease of one residential unit, approximately 1 million square feet of vacant area, approximately 144,183 square feet of freshwater wetlands, and approximately 387,841 square feet of submerged land. The proposed project would add approximately 207 daily workers to the project site over two shifts, 
during peak operations, as well as four security staff and three administrative staff per day. There would be a decrease of approximately three residents on site compared to the no action condition. This incremental difference between the no action and with action reasonable worst case development scenario highlighted here in this table will serve as the basis of the impact analyses in the DEIS. Next slide, please. As detailed in the draft scope of work and shown in this slide, the reasonable worst case development scenario triggers analysis of 13 of the 19 impact categories outlined in the seeker technical manual. The draft scope provides a detailed outline of how these technical areas will be examined. And for each of the technical areas, it identifies study areas, types of data to be gathered, and how these data would be analyzed and potential impacts quantified when appropriate. Per the guidance of the seeker technical manual, the proposed project would not warrant analysis of socioeconomic conditions, community facilities, open space, shadows, solid waste, or energy. I will briefly discuss a few of the technical areas to be analyzed in the EIS. For example, as the proposed actions would affect regulations and policies governing land use within the approximately 32 and a half acre project site, an analysis of land use, zoning, and public policy would be provided. As the project site is located along the Arthur Kill and the proposed project would entail in-water work, including filling and dredging activities, a natural, a natural resources assessment will be provided. The proposed actions would also result in an increase in travel demand, and therefore the DEIS will include an analysis of the proposed actions effects on traffic conditions in the area. The EIS will also include analyses of noise and air quality, given the use of equipment at the project site to assemble offshore wind components before being loaded onto specialized vessels. Construction of the proposed project is expected to take place over a period of 20 to 23 months and is therefore considered short-term pursuant to seeker technical manual and does not warrant a detailed construction analysis. The DEIS will provide a qualitative discussion that will describe the proposed construction program and phasing and will qualitatively examine the potential short-term construction impacts of the proposed project as described in the draft scope. Next slide, please. In addition, the DEIS will include a mitigation chapter which would describe mitigation measures to address any significant adverse impacts that are identified in the technical analyses. Finally, an alternatives chapter will be included in the DEIS to evaluate reasonable options that may reduce or eliminate significant ad adverse action related impacts. The alternatives are usually defined when the full extent of the proposed actions impacts are determined. At this time, the DEIS is expected to analyze a no action alternative and an alternative that avoids any identified unmitigated significant adverse impacts. Other additional alternatives may be developed in consultation with the Department of City Planning during the scoping process. Next slide, please. The draft scope of work can be viewed in its entirety online at the Department of City Planning's website. Thank you. I will now turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you all for that summary of the project and the draft scope of work. Um, next slide. Uh, we will now move on to part two of the meeting. At this time, we'll be receiving testimony from elected officials, community board leaders, and representatives of government agencies. Uh, when it's your turn to speak, your name will be called and you'll be promoted to panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and the ability to turn on your camera if you wish. There will be a short period that it appears that you're no longer in the meeting. Uh, don't be alarmed. You'll automatically rejoin the meeting as a panelist. Uh, if anyone's experiencing technical difficulties that prevent you from sharing your testimony, uh, we will pause and move on to the next speaker to allow us to reach out and troubleshoot in the background, and we'll come back to you once that's been resolved. Um, if this happens, we also uh, invite folks to revisit the how-to guides on the NYC Engage website uh, for assistance. Uh, you're also have another option for assistance, which is to hang up uh, if you're dialing in and call this toll-free number 877-853-5247. That's also displayed on this screen. Uh, when prompted for a meeting ID, dial 618-237-7396. And when prompted for a password, dial 1. All right. I'm consulting with our team. Um, 
it does not appear that we have anyone in the second group of speakers, um, government agencies, elected officials, or representatives of the community board. Um, so at this point, we will move on to part three of the public scoping meeting, where members of the general public will be invited to speak for up to three minutes. Um, a timer will uh, display on, on the screen when you begin your testimony. Um, so I will ask that, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Great. Um, so at the three minute mark, you'll be asked to conclude your remarks. Um, and again, we we do um, ask people to, to revisit the how to guides on NYC and gauge um, if anyone needs assistance or the toll free number that I mentioned just previously. Okay, checking with the team. Um, it looks like we do have one one person um, that is present but has not registered. Um, Brian McLaughlin, would are you interested in providing testimony today? Can someone unmute Brian and see if he's here to provide testimony today? Um, Brian, you look unmuted. Are you able to let us know if you're here to provide testimony? No, or just... I'm not here to provide testimony. Okay, thank you. We just wanted to be sure. Great. Um, all right. So there are actually no members of the public present here today um, who are, are interested in providing testimony. Um, I do want to make sure that folks, uh, if they're listening in or, or tuning in a little bit late, or joining us on the YouTube, uh, do have a few minutes to uh, register to speak if they are interested. Um, those uh, instructions, again, are available on uh, the NYC Engage website. Um, so we will give a few moments. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And the next slide. One more slide, please. Excellent. Uh, one back. Yes, five minute break. So we'll now take a five minute break um, just to allow anyone who's tuning in on the YouTube to sign up to speak if you haven't been able to yet. Um, lots of details here about how to register to speak or um, how to reach out to us if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, so now we're, we're going to take about a five minute break. We'll, we'll return here at 2.49 um, to see if anyone has signed up to speak. Um, otherwise, we will move to close this meeting. Um, we'll be back here in a few minutes. Thank you and, and talk soon.
All right. Good afternoon. Welcome back. I know we started the, the timer over again, so we'll uh, dive back into the meeting. Uh, if you can go to the uh, next slide. Perfect. Um, so good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, again, you're turning in to, tuning in to the remote public scoping meeting for the Arthur Kill Terminal Project. Uh, again, for the record, this proposal seeker number is 23DCP056R. My name is Stephanie Shalou, Director of Environmental Assessments. Uh, Assessment and Review Division at the New York City Department of City Planning. Uh, we're currently on part three of the public scoping meeting where members of the general public can speak and provide testimony uh, on the draft scope of work for up to three minutes. Um, and we were on a five minute break, uh, seeing if any other participants, members of the public um, or otherwise who who would register online during the break, um, who, who may have decided to provide testimony here today. Um, checking with our team uh, in the back, it does not look like any other um, members of the public or otherwise have signed up to speak, uh, nor is there anyone here in the room with us um, here today uh, via phone or via Zoom. Um, so it does not appear that we have anyone else here today who's wishing to provide testimony. Um, if anyone is in the room and does wish to do so, please uh, indicate by, by using the raise hand function in Zoom. All right, so if no one else wishes to speak at this time, we will move ahead to close the public scoping meeting. Uh, if anyone did have difficulty providing testimony today, please recall that you can submit written testimony um, by visiting the upcoming meetings page or the past meetings page now on the NYC Engage portal uh, through DCP's website um, and by emailing and mailing your comments to the Department of City Planning's website um, or mailing them to, to our office. Uh, can we pull up the very last slide of the presentation just to have these details up again? Um, and as a reminder, the deadline for submitting written comments is uh, 5 p.m. on Tuesday, December 27th, 2022. Uh, so again, here is the email address and the mailing address for written comments, which again, we provide the same attention and consideration um, as comments provided during the scoping meeting. All right, that brings us to the end of our meeting today. Thank you all for uh, for watching and participating. Uh, the time is approximately 2.51 p.m. and this scoping meeting is now closed. Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon.